Good morning, everybody. I'm Bonnie Glazer. I'm a senior fellow here with the Freeman Chair for China Studies at uh, CSIS. Thank you all for coming. There have been many events in Washington to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, but we think that ours is particularly special. Um, I will first introduce uh, our uh, special guest here, who will then introduce our um, even more special guest speaking to us uh, from Taipei. Uh, Mr. Richard Armitage uh, has had a very distinguished career of uh, public service, beginning in the U.S. Navy and in several administrations, both in the Department of Defense and the Department of State. Uh, his most recent post, as you all know, uh, was as Deputy Secretary of State from 2001 until 2005, and Mr. Armitage is now uh, President of Armitage International and, importantly, a member of our Board of Trustees here at CSIS. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Richard Armitage. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Good evening, Mr. President. It's a delight to see you uh, looking so well this evening in Taipei. I want to report to you, you have a room full of uh, uh, policy experts, uh, academics, uh, businessmen and women all who are friends of Taiwan and supporters of Taiwan, and they're quivering with anticipation at what you might uh, have to say uh, to us this morning. And I can also report to you, Mr. President, uh, that your excellent ambassador, Jason Yuen, has made it back from Taipei in good shape after testifying, and he's here this morning uh, as well. We're, we're honored to have him. Sir, uh, on this 30th anniversary, uh, the men and women who uh, work in CSIS are extremely honored that you've chosen this venue to give this very important address. Uh, we're absolutely thrilled. And I might say, if it meets with your approval, Mr. President, uh, after you've given your remarks, if you'd be willing to take a few questions uh, from the audience, I will uh, read them to you and uh, we'll uh, await your reply. And then I understand you want to make a, a, some wrap-up remarks at the end, and so we'll make sure we leave some room for that, if that meets with your approval. Mr. Armitage, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to be here today I'd like to extend my deep appreciation to the Center for Strategic and International Studies for making this event possible. CSIS has been a true leader among U.S. think tanks for the last half century, providing clarity and wisdom in the often intricate world of diplomacy and security studies. Before I begin my remarks, I'd like to take a moment to thank Mr. Richard Armitage for his kind introduction. Mr. Armitage has long been a friend of the Republic of China on Taiwan. During his tenure at the Defense Department under President Ronald Reagan, and later at the State Department under President George Bush, Mr. Armitage performed a vital role in carrying out the letter and spirit of the Taiwan Relations Act. I'm therefore honored by and appreciative of Mr. Armitage's participation in today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, we gather here today to commemorate an auspicious occasion started 30 years ago when U.S. lawmakers across the aisles had the vision and foresight to write into law what would become the foundation of an unprecedented and, in retrospect, unparalleled partnership. They realized that as the United States established formal diplomatic relations with China and China, America's relations in our region did not have to be the product of a zero-sum equation, and that its engagement with Beijing did not have to be an all-or-nothing proposition. Certain obstacles would not have been overcome without America's enduring commitment to the principles embodied in the TRA. For example, President Ronald Reagan's six assurances in 1982 relating to continued arms sales to Taiwan reminded us that the evolution of U.S.-China relations would not have a deleterious effect on America's special bond with Taiwan. Similarly, President Bill Clinton's decision to send two aircraft carrier bottle trips to the Taiwan Strait in 1996 demonstrated our allies' firm resolve to preserve peace and stability of the region. Since the enactment of the TRA three decades ago, 
U.S. commitment to Taiwan has not only remained steadfast, but has grown in strength. Last month, 125 members of the U.S. House of Representatives endorsed, in a voice vote on House Concurrent Resolution 55, pledging an unwavering commitment to the TRA and calling it a cornerstone of U.S. policy. This resolution further reiterates America's long-standing policy to provide Taiwan with arms of defensive character to maintain the capacity to resist any forms of coercion that will jeopardize the social, economic, or political system of Taiwan. Moreover, President Barack Obama, Secretary Hillary Clinton, and other senior statesmen have all unambiguously expressed positive overtures and support for Taiwan's defense and the maintenance of peace, security, and a healthy balance in the Taiwan Strait. The continual affirmation of the TRA's commitment to Taiwan security shows that our two governments share a common strategic perspective. The strong security partnership established by the TRA not only provided a basis for the people of Taiwan to embark on a journey of democratization, but also allow our citizenry that is rich in entrepreneurship the opportunity to build a free market economy that has today become the 18th largest in the world. In many rich respects, this landmark legislation helped launch the emergence of what I call the Taiwan spirit of benevolence, perseverance, diligence, honesty, and hard work that has been the touchstone of our success. During the last eight years, from 2000 to 2008, we have had a lot of time to reflect on what went wrong with the country, especially why Taiwan's economy has slipped as a leading engine of growth in the region. One conclusion I draw is that some in our society have been excessively burdened with the legacies of civil war and the Cold War, while others have been gripped perhaps too tightly by the so-called victimization complex, hoping to break out and change the status quo at all costs. Unfortunately, instead of contributing to the advancement of the nation, both my set had in truth only disrupted social harmony at home and incurred tension abroad. As such, precious political and economic capital has not been efficiently allocated to cultivate an environment for reform and development in Taiwan in these last years. Since the outset of my administration, my focus has been more on Taiwan geography rather than on its history. Geographically speaking, I believe the island of Taiwan is a premium piece of real estate in the world. To its east, the United States is the largest economy and the sole superpower of the world. To its north, west, and south, Japan, mainland China, and ASEAN nations are the second third and the fifth largest economies respectively. Taiwan is fortunate to be so advantageously located at the center of this dense and rich network of economic powerhouses. In addition, Taiwan is culturally and linguistically familiar with all its neighbors. Combined together, Taiwan is optimally situated to serve as a conduit and springboard for multilateral exchange and growth. In other words, to provide the platform for a multifaceted win-win situation. However, to achieve this goal, Taiwan must fully capitalize and leverage these assets to its maximum advantage by linking up with all the members of this super economic network, including mainland China. If we succeed, Taiwan will indeed become a treasure island that will be accessible to and from these countries, next to none in East Asia. Having lost a good eight years, we should now look forward toward the 21st century and take full advantage of this invaluable geographical asset. For obvious reasons, cross-strait relations occupy a special place in this new geographic perspective. For too long, this relationship has been described as hot economic but cold politics. Nowhere has this discrepancy grown to such gaping proportions than in recent years, where it threatened not only the security of Taiwan, but peace and stability in East Asia. However, 
Since my administration came into office last May, we have get into motion the elements that will not only defuse trust retention, but more importantly, embed a new foundation for stability. At the center of this new cross-strait reproachment is the 1992 consensus. That is, both sides recognize that there is only one China, but agree to defer on its definition. Past negotiations with the mainland over 15 years ago were also founded upon this premise. So a common understanding has existed ever since. This very fact has been well recognized by former President George Bush in his key March 26 telephone conversation with Benin Chinese last year on the 1992 consensus. That is one China, with each side having its respective interpretation. The policies of my administration will drive the impetus to move cross-strait relations forward and beyond the hostility and brinksmanship witnessed in the last eight years. Upon a new foundation, rooted in mutual benefit and friendship, we reopen negotiations channels after a hiatus of over a decade. Since then, my administration has worked incessantly to fulfill our campaign promise to our people of improving cross-strait relations. These include the inauguration and expansion of cross-strait direct charter flights, opening up Taiwan to mainland tourists, hosting Two, unprecedented and historical high-level talks between the Strait Exchange Foundation, SEF, and its mainland counterpart, Association for Relations Across the Taiwan Strait, ARATS. The Changchen talks have already resulted in six groundbreaking agreements, which have enhanced mutual cooperation in a range of important issues, from direct links to food safety. In Virtually a few months, my administration has transformed 60 years of cross-street relations to better reflect the needs of our people and realities of the changing times. We are fully aware that for Taiwan to maintain its strength vis-a-vis -vis the mainland, Taiwan must strengthen its international competitiveness. As mainland China becomes the workshop of the world, normalizing economic relations with the other side is a crucial step in achieving this goal. The prospective creation of the Cross-Strait Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, ECFA, is at the heart of this idea. The spirit of ECFA conjoins Taiwan's interest with the ideals of liberalization and globalization. By concluding the ECFA with the mainland, while also building Taiwan into an innovation and logistics center for multinational companies, we will surely bolster and safeguard Taiwan's competitive edge in the mainland market and in turn, the greater global market. The benefits of ECFA to the international community, including American investors, are more than obvious. Opening the three links and the goodwill behind them have made flying, shipping, or mailing across the street a feasible option now. Together with a more stable political environment, there will be more incentives for foreign business to include Taiwan in their regional operations. By changing our cross-street policy, we were able to restore mutual trust and cooperation in Taiwan's bilateral relations with other countries. Of particular importance is Taiwan's relationship with the United States. My administration's foreign policy style can be aptly described as surprise-free and low-key. And I believe that in the past few months, we have made significant strides in restoring American trust in Taiwan. In particular, I want to express my appreciation to President Barack Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton for acknowledging the positive contributions to cross relations that our policy has brought about. The United States' positive assessment and support of current cross street developments demonstrate our policies are being favorably received. In truth, the policies of my administration share the same common ideals as those embodied in the Taiwan Relations Act. This sentiment was echoed by American Institute in Taiwan Chairman Raymond Burgar, who recently welcomed this new era of uh, cross-strait civility 
as not only reducing the danger of miscalculations, but also creating real tangible economic benefits for American and American business as a whole. These goals are at the heart of my foreign policy calling for flexible diplomacy, in which we have taken the first step toward reconciliation with the mainland by declaring a diplomatic truce. This truce will bring about the end of diplomatic belligerency so that we can concentrate on issues that will yield more real and substantive rewards. This includes my administration's goal to expand Taiwan's international space. Of course, foremost, we hope to enhance Taiwan's meaningful participation in international organizations for the betterment of our citizens. My administration firmly believes that it is the equal rights and human rights of our citizens to access international services vital to their well-being. Therefore, participating in the World Health Assembly, WHA, is an endeavor that we, will, that we will not stop pursuing until the day our citizens can enjoy the same health resources and information freely get granted to the rest of the world. The United States has always been one of our strongest supporters in joining IGOs, so I express my deep appreciation. As a champion of democratic rights and freedom, I hope America will take up the banner with us and call for greater fairness when judging Taiwan's international role. However, I want to emphasize that Taiwan's international space is not a one-sided arrangement. Instead, it is a mutually beneficial scheme that will not only provide our citizens the right to access international services, but also a chance to give back to the world in more meaningful and substantive ways. Taiwan is a democratically thriving, economically prosperous country endowed with sophisticated scientific, technological, and medical expertise. We are proud of the fact that today Taiwan has the capability to make significant contributions to foreign aid. In fact, we remember that it was once the general donations of other countries, such as the United States, that helped us achieve our own economic miracle and social advancement. Therefore, I hope to revamp Taiwan's foreign aid so that we can provide more effective and ethical assistance in alleviating the sufferings of recipient countries. In addition to foreign aid, Taiwan will also work to expand its bilateral relations with the United States and other countries in common interest and value. We will move forward as a responsible peacemaker, helping to safeguard the stability of the international system so that economic and peaceful relations can continue to prosper in the region. Taiwan's democratic system, strong rule of law, and sophisticated social services will provide multinational firms a better point of entry into the mainland market. As you can see, when Taiwan expands its international space and global community benefit as well. The future prospect of Taiwan-U.S. relations will particularly focus on issues of low politics with an emphasis on pragmatism. We will work closely with our American friends on issues such as opening Taiwan's market to U.S. agricultural products, promoting e-commerce, exploring ways to reform our investment environment for mutual benefit, and improving the protection of intellectual property rights. We would also like to conclude an extradition agreement as well as participate in America's visa waiver program. Furthermore, as trade has been one of the major facets of our thriving relationship, we hope to enhance this through an FTA with the United States. Of course, U.S. arms sales is equally, if not more, central to our relations, in which I want to reassure America that Taiwan will not free ride on the United States for its own security. Last month, we published a quadrennial defense review that shows our intention to build up our military strength on the principle of resolute defense, effective deterrence. On top of that, we have made plans to create an all-volunteer force to enhance the professionalism of our military. Furthermore, starting from this year, our defense budget will reach at least 3% of GDP. However, the delicate balance of the status quo is being shaken by the gross military imbalances across the strait. Therefore, I urge the United States to not hesitate 
to provide Taiwan with the necessary defensive arms as stipulated in the TRA. My administration will continue to redouble our efforts in not only removing obstacles, but also realizing new potentials for the mutual benefit of our bilateral relationship. In particular, we will continue to look towards America for guidance and inspiration in advancing our own democracy. President Obama once said that as Americans, we can take enormous pride in the fact that courage has been inspired by our own struggle for free freedom, by the tradition of democratic law secured by our forefathers and enshrined in our constitution. With these words of inspiration, Taiwan's own endeavor to improve human rights protection has also entered a new era. A few weeks ago, under my leadership, our legislative yuan passed with overwhelming enthusiasm the two United Nations conventions concerning human rights, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. We, by adopting uh, implementing statute, also made these two United Nations co covenants a part of our domestic law at the same time, so that we may do away with the difficult, if not impossible, move of depositing them with the United Nations Secretariat pursuant to the requirement of the covenants. The passing of these two covenants signifies a historic milestone in Taiwan's democratic development, especially in, re in regard to human rights protection. In the next two years, the Ministry of Justice and related agencies will execute a comprehensive plan to implement these covenants in Taiwan. Ladies and gentlemen, in the past 30 years since the enactment of the Taiwan Relations Act, we have witnessed defining moments when its principles have come to life through the inspired actions of both our leaders and our people. I'm sure the next 30 years we'll see a new chapter of the TRA requiring the same, if not more, inspiration that derives from our mutual desire for enduring security, stability, and peace. If it is for this reason that the TRA will remain an essential blueprint, reminding us of our commitment and inspiring us to proceed with confidence toward the future. Thank you. Mr. President, I, I know that I speak for everyone here at CSIS this morning when I thank you for that uplifting, upbeat, uh, spirited speech. As far as I'm concerned, it was an extraordinary act of statesmanship and one that uh, humbles us uh, to have been able to hear it firsthand. And I think equally all of us in this audience today join with you in celebrating that unique Taiwan spirit you spoke about benevolence and perseverance and honesty, diligence and hard work, and have no doubt that you will uh, see Taiwan as the treasure island, as you stated. So congratulations on a masterful speech. Sir, I have a couple of questions that have been collected from the audience, uh, but I'm going to take advantage, if I may, of this podium and ask the first one myself. Uh, you, sir, have expressed in the past some interest in a possible peace accord, uh, and President uh, Hu Jintao, in his New Year's address, mentioned the possibility of military confidence-building measures. I just wonder if you've given much thought to how you see this process evolving. Uh, what steps would you envision the respective ministries of defense to take? And given the fact that the People's Republic of China has more than 1,000 missiles across the straits, is it necessary for them to move first? Thank you, sir. The statement of uh, Mr. Hu Jintao released on December 31st last year was uh, obviously a positive one. Uh, there are things uh, specifically focusing on some of the uh, ideas we have expressed in the last couple of months. Uh, so we actually have already responded in, to some of his uh, uh, statements. For instance, when he talked about a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement we responded by proposing an ECFA, Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, because we believe 
by using this uh, uh, form of uh, agreement, we'll be able to cover many areas of uh, trade, investment, and other matters uh, which will contribute to the normalization of economic relations with the mainland. On the uh, issue of building, uh, confidence-building measures, particularly in the uh, military field, we think that these are rather difficult and sensitive. And at the moment, we have been overwhelmingly preoccupied with economic issues, which are not only urgent, but also closely related to the livelihood of our people. So we would rather put the economic issues uh, as a priority item, hoping to resolve at least the, the majority of them before we move, move ahead with other more sensitive, more intractable issues. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, sir, with uh, improving communication between uh, Taiwan and China, how do you see the role of the U.S. evolving or changing as compared to the previous 30 years? Uh, you mean the U.S. role? Yes, sir. Uh, I think, as I put it in my uh, address, the U.S. has played a very constructing role in the process. First of all, the enactment of the Taiwan Relations Act has effectively uh, supported Taiwan after the U.S. switch recognition from Taipei to Beijing. As I said uh, in another occasion, uh, one commentator in the United States uh, uh, in a law review says, while the uh, Washington-Beijing joint communique establishing diplomatic relations de-recognized Taiwan, the Taiwan Relations Act has re-recognized it. So in, as far as the domestic effect of a de-recognition has been largely erased by the Taiwan Relations Act, and that is very important to maintain continuity of the relationship between Taiwan and the United States. For instance, there are uh, 58 uh, treaties in force between the two sides at a time. So this act itself, plus other uh, additions such as the six assurances uh, offered by President Reagan in 1982, help uh, set up a, a new model for conducting relations between the two sides. And the U.S. strong support of Taiwan to a point where the, the U.S. can send aircraft uh, battle, aircraft battle groups to uh, Taiwan shows that the U.S. sincerity and that uh, made a very important contribution to maintain not just the security of Taiwan but also stability in the region. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, you of uh, your administration and you yourself today in this excellent speech have emphasized the importance of establishing a relationship with the World Health Organization. Are there any other organizations uh, that you feel it is equally important for Taipei to establish a relationship with? We work on one organization at a time. <laughs> we want to make sure. <laughs> we want to make sure that uh, we can get into the uh, the, the WHA this time, and uh, I think the outcome will be uh, known in a few weeks. This is very important. It's not just a political issue; it's also the issue of human rights. Yeah. So we could, we hope, we could uh, make it this time which we have been working for a long 12 years. And if that can be done, then we will uh, see what we can do next. Well, I think everyone in this room today, Mr. President, joins you in a sincere desire that we will increase the international space and that decision, which will be known in a few weeks, will be a positive one from your point of view. Sir, many here in Washington would cite the restoration of confidence in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship as a major achievement during your tenure thus far. And now that this relationship is on a better footing, what do you think is achievable during the remainder of your term to capitalize on the improved environment? So I guess what I'm really asking is, do you have specific goals for enhanced U.S.-Taiwan relations? I mentioned also uh, a few moments ago, uh, on the U.S. side, the U.S. Uh, interest in... Uh, uh, selling more agricultural products to Taiwan, which uh, we uh, are considered as seriously. But we also want to uh, have an extradition treaty, extradition agreement with Taiwan so that we can bring back uh, some uh, fugitives of uh, economic crime. They are now at large in the United States. 
In addition to that, uh, we have already had the visa waiver program with other countries, for instance with Japan, which help uh, tremendously the increase of tourists on, uh, to and from Taiwan. We, also, we hope we could do that with the United States as well. Certainly, as the U.S. is our number three trading partner, we hope we could also have an FTA with the United States in the future. Obviously, we understand very well that at the time, the administration has no authorization from Congress, but so we are doing something the experts call building blocks. First, we have a bilateral investment agreement, a uh, double taxation agreement, and hoping in the future we can build the blocks into a free trade agreement. I think it's very important that you have those specifics uh, to lay before the administration and give our colleagues who are now serving in government specific targets to try to meet. And I think it makes it a lot easier, frankly, for uh, those targets to be achieved when we're dealing with specifics and not with sort of just uh, language and, and rhetoric. Uh, Mr. President, uh, intellectual exchange is the basis for a broader range of mutual understanding. However, we can see few mainland students studying in Taiwan right now. I'm wondering what kind of strategies would be adopted to accept more mainland students. Well, uh, it is our policy to recognize the diploma of mainland universities. Uh, as for the mainland students, the current plan is that uh, we will uh, allow them to come to Taiwan in the uh, spring of next year. First, for a graduate student and in the fall for undergraduate students. And this is unprecedented, and certainly there are different opinions inside Taiwan. So in the beginning, we will have rather restrictive pr practices uh, in terms of the, the students' uh, uh, disciplines, uh, at the number and the areas the university could enter, and gradually we'll see whether that will work very well to us. So there are primarily three objectives we have in mind. First of all, the idea to let many students come into Taiwan to attend our campuses is to let the young people of the two sides of Taiwan Strait to get together early in their life so that they can become friends. And that will have long lasting effect for future relations between Taiwan and the mainland. Secondly, Obviously, we also want to recruit the, bright, the, the, the best and the brightest students from the mainland to give our students a good uh, stimulus so that both can compete uh, in a very harmonious uh, environment. And number three, now we have roughly 130 universities and colleges, and our, the passing rate of our college and university uh, exams it's sometimes uh, close to 90%. So in a way, we have uh, uh, surplus capacity for our universities. On the other hand, in the Chinese mainland, uh, roughly uh, uh, slightly more than 50% of the high school graduates can get a place in their universities. So each year, more than uh, uh, 4 million students couldn't find a place. So I think this could also be a uh, good place for them to come to Taiwan. So uh, I think we, if we can come over here, they could fully utilize the surplus uh, capacity of some of the uh, private universities. So there are basically three reasons. I hope this will serve as a good way to understand each other more in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for that very specific answer. That's terrific. Uh, sir, I, I realize that um, this anniversary, this 30th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act compels us to talk about U.S. and Taiwan relations. But I wonder if we can take advantage of your time here this evening, sir, uh, to ask about other countries, for instance, uh, Japan, your relation, the development of the relations with Japan or others in Asia. As a matter of fact, the improvement of relations between Taiwan and the Chinese mainland also bring benefits to our relations with um, the rest of the world. The U.S. is one. And for Japan, uh, we specifically designate this year as the year for a special partnership relationship between Taiwan and Japan. So we hope 
We think this year we will be able to set up an office in a northern city in Japan. Uh, so to uh, for for Taiwan tourists, as you know, as we uh, the both sides have a visa waiver program, there the a sudden surge of Taiwan tourists to Japan, and this is something to accommodate their needs. Secondly, we will uh, add a cultural office in our representative office in Tokyo in order to promote the cultural exchange and. The both sides are ser seriously uh, considering the possibility of having an exhibition of the National Palace Museum, our treasures from Taiwan. And we will also start a new chapter in aviation between the Haneda Airport in Japan, near Tokyo, and the uh, Songsan Airport in Taipei. These two airports used to be international airports, but fell into disuse and uh, uh, transform into a domestic airport. Now, both airports like to have international flights. So beginning next year, sometime in the later part of next year, we first start with uh, four charter flights each. And this will be a uh, important milestone in aviation relation between the two sides. And beginning this year, uh, in June, we will start a new program of working holidays between Taiwan and Japan with the participation of young people from 18 to 30 years old, they could stay in each other's territory for up to one year, working and then uh, uh, and studying and, and spending their holidays over there. And we have just concluded a, uh, a fishery uh, consultation meeting with the, with the Japanese people uh, two months ago, which will also help uh, the two sides to regulate the fishing uh, uh, order in the waters between them. So there are quite a few programs that are going on now. And the both sides understand that while we improve our relations with Beijing, we will do the same with Japan. After all, we have had a long relationship with our Japanese friends. So as I uh, said earlier, the improvement of relations between Taiwan and the mainland has actually benefit our relations uh, with other parts of the world as well. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Sir, if you would indulge me, two more questions, and then we'll turn it back to you uh, for uh, closing uh, remarks. Uh, sir, what mechanisms or other efforts are you setting up to forge a national consensus on matters of national security? As you know, in Taiwan, there are people who um, have uh, many suspicions about our rapprochement with the Chinese mainland. And uh, during my uh, presidential campaign a year ago, I've always been accused of uh, uh, potentially selling out Taiwan. And actually, uh, we are a democracy. Nobody can sell out the country. You know, it's a major decision will be determined by the people, including the future of Taiwan. But for issues like uh, mainland relations, uh, certainly we will explain, clarify whatever uh, are needed to our people. For instance, in, in the issue of ECFA, the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, uh, some people said if we sign such agreement, that means that we also agree to unification with the mainland. So the kind of distortion or misunderstanding have to be clarified. So the Mainland Affairs Council, which is the agency in charge of conducting relations with the mainland, sent a lot of people to all corners of the country to explain them what it is. According to a recent opinion poll conducted just a, uh, a couple of days ago, indicate that around 70% of the people in general support uh, concluding such an agreement with the mainland. They understand very well that in the past 10 months, we have already concluded several, about six agreements with the mainland. None of those uh, has anything that will derogate our sovereignty at all. So I think we have already established the credibility that what we do is to put the interests of Taiwan ahead of anything. And as I said, Taiwan is a democracy. No one can sell out Taiwan. 
We will work for the interests of our people, and we'll continue to do that in the future. Well spoken, sir. Sir, one final uh, query, if I may. Uh, you mentioned in your remarks this evening uh, the uh, QDR just uh, just released uh, your review of defense requirements. I wonder if you could share with us what, if you have any preliminary views on what your top priorities in, in weapon sales would be from the uh, Obama administration. Two years ago, we uh, uh, made a request to acquire uh, seven categories of uh, weaponry from the United States. And in October last year, the Bush administration notified Congress on five of them. So we are very appreciative of the American support. There are two others. One is re related to um, these uh, submarines, which is only a feasibility study. And, uh, and the other one we are uh, proposing is F-16CD. We need the kind of uh, high-performance jet fighters to replace our aging fleet of F-5s and other less sophisticated weaponry. You see, well, the defensive arms we are going to acquire from the United States are for defense purposes. And uh, in view of the uh, uh, sharp changes in the military balance across Taiwan Strait, I think this is uh, fully justified for the U.S to seriously consider selling us. And uh, don't worry that the sale of arms to us will uh, jeopardize uh, your relations with the mainland. Remember almost uh, 20 years ago, when we made similar requests for uh, the F-16s, at a time we were also able to reach a consensus with the mainland on the most intractable issue of one China. So that is the uh, the, the, the story of the uh, 92 consensus. So at the same time, we, are, we sort of uh, have a consensus with the mainland, and we acquire F-16s from the United States. We acquire uh, Mirage 2005 from the France, and we also had a high economic uh, growth rate, and we, are, we were also doing constitutional reform at the time. So uh, many things of this sort could be done at the same time. And I think even the mainland understand very well that at the moment we want to improve relations with the mainland, but we also have to, as a government, to maintain military balance across the Taiwan Strait. Mr. President, you've been fantastic and a very good sport in indulging uh, these questions tonight. Uh, before turning it over to you for your wrap-up remarks, if you'd allow me to say, and I, I know I'm speaking for everyone in this audience here today, that Although previously we spoke about confidence-building measures in the context of Hu Jintao's New Year's message, I think what you've done today here has really been a confidence-building uh, measure for the United States, for all of those friends of Taiwan, for those who have worked so hard for, to help this democracy develop. Uh, and I must say uh, that there's no question in this room today we have full confidence that the fate of the people of Taiwan is in very good hands, as evidenced by the answers to the questions uh, by President Mai and Joe. So, sir, we thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to you. All my fellow friends, ladies and gentlemen, though we are near the end of today's event, in truth, we have only just begun a new journey towards bright horizons. The story of Taiwan is rooted in the turbulence of the turn of the last century, when the entire world underwent a great up upheaval. It would be the U.S. open-door policy that would change the trajectory of China's development and bring about the dawn of Western ideal to the Far East. The Republic of China was born out of this dream for freedom, democracy, and equality for the Chinese people. This point in history would also mark the start of a deep and long-standing friendship between the Republic of China and the United States, a friendship forged in common ideals and spirit. After 1949, a great part of Taiwan's success also rose out of our alliance with the United States. America's unwavering support drove the momentum for Taiwan's modernization. We were also known that 60 years later, this small island would today bear the torch of democracy for all Chinese people. The Republic of China on Taiwan can be proud to know that it has truly achieved the dreams of our nation's forefathers. Now, as I stand here before you, 
Taiwan is once again on the brink of taking the next step forward as we and the world shed the grievances of the past marred in the two uh, world wars and cold wars. We must look ahead towards this new era of engagement. President Obama often emphasized this idea. My administration will not fail to rise to the occasion and place in Taiwan at the forefront of the new, this new global trend. Our policies will be founded upon the principles of pragmatism, accountability, and trust. We will seek to become responsible stakeholders in the international community. We will be responsible leaders of our domestic politics. We will strengthen the backbone of Taiwan's rule of law and the civil liberties to our people. We will engage men in China for the benefit of our nation's prosperity as well as the greater advancement of the Chinese community. I envision a Taiwan open to the world where our stable political and economic system will be a source of pride for our people as well as a source of inspiration for the rest of the world. I'm confident that my administration is paving the way toward this future. As was true more than half a century ago, the United States will always be an integral part of Taiwan development. In the past, America served as the champion of Taiwan democracy and economic liberalization. Today, the United States will be the paradigm for which Taiwan will emulate and inspire the rest of East Asia. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. President, you've honored us greatly, uh, and we're now going to return that honor by letting you go off and, and run the country. Uh, but I, I must say that all of, all of your friends here join me in wishing through you to the people of Taiwan every best wish in this year of the ox and beyond, and we have every assurance of your success. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I think today's session is also an important confidence, confidence building measure between Taiwan and the United States. And, and I thank you very much for organizing this event. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, sir.